Good morning, friendship. Glad to see each of you here, and we'll get the rest in once they get enough cookies and muffins. I wanted to invite Hillary uh, Cullen and Justin Cheney up here. So the first service voted them in. They have had a, the newcomers class. They've met with one of the elders. They've been baptized by immersion, and they want to join with fellowship here at Friendship Community Baptist Church. So all those in favor of welcoming them, welcoming them into membership, say amen. amen. Any opposed? Well, congrats. Now you guys are full members, all right? So yes, absolutely. We're thrilled to that. Make sure you get a chance to see them and welcome them. Thank you guys so much. I do want to welcome you to the service this morning. I do believe there is a scripture that we can read as we begin worship this morning, which goes something like this. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Oh, my friends, my prayer and my hope is that you are one of those righteous people who will never be moved, whose heart is trusting in the Lord. Would you stand with us and join us in singing this morning? Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever be We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes. ever say worthy of every breath we could ever feel we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up
it's just me, but I feel like when I'm tired, some of my walls come down and I can start sort of seeing things and feeling things that I don't normally, um, because I'm not just all logic and routine. So I hope that God can speak to you now, tear down some of those walls and help you to see spiritual battles that are going around and spiritual victories that are being won all around by him because the victory is already won um, and we have all the support and the power that we need to fight whatever we're fighting so I hope that he can show that to you now Let's pray. Father God, uh, it's so hard to come up with words adequate to describe you and to worship you. Oh, Father, we uh, know that there's no one like you. You're totally awesome in every way. You created all things. You sustain all things. And all good things come from you because you are good. And Father, you love us because you are love. Father, when we think about your majesty and your glory and your holiness, we can't help but be aware of our sins and failures. And Father, we confess that we think and say and do things that we shouldn't and that we fail to do things that we should. We thank you, Father, that Jesus paid for our sins. We thank you so much for your forgiveness and your mercy, your grace. We pray for your cleansing according to each of our needs. Father God, we thank you for taking care of us every day. We thank you for your protection and guidance and blessing. And Father, we pray that you would help us to honor you in such a way that we would attract others to Jesus and reflect your love to others. Pray that you'd help our faith to grow as we get to know you better every day. And as we see your answers to prayer, we pray for your guidance and wisdom for all the decisions that life brings. Father, we pray for the poor, for those in prison, uh, for those who are being persecuted, for those who are grieving. And Father, I, I pray for comfort for Jimmy Arnold's family, the loss of his brother this past week. Pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to partner with you in serving others. We pray for those who we know who are ill 
or injured or addicted or just need to know Jesus as their Savior. Father, uh, I'd like to mention uh, some of the events of this past week and, and that have been going on for a while where we've had uh, violence and mass shootings and so forth. We pray that you would help to stem this in our nation. <clears throat> Father, we pray for recovery for those affected. We pray for the families, friends, co-workers of the adults, and uh, yes, even children and first responders who have died. And Father, we pray for those who serve and lead in our country. We pray that they would do so with integrity, with safety, and that they would do what's right. <clears throat> Father, we lift up all who serve and lead here at FCBC. And we pray now, Father, that uh, you would um, just help us to be aware of your presence. We pray that you would encourage us. We pray that you would instruct us. Pray that we would experience your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now we're going to have Malachi come and read from Matthew. Oh, yeah, you can stand. <laughs> Good morning, friends. Today will be today's scripture will be out of Matthew five, verses thirteen through twenty. Teaching about salt and light, Jesus says this: "You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of this world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden." No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to the, everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Teaching about the law. Don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teacher's a religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks. Let's continue singing and worshiping.
with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, 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 the power of Christ in me, Christ's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, ever the name. 
doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making way for someone. God is doing something right now, right now. He is moving mountains, making way for someone. God is. Is that your prayer this morning? Do you need to be healed? Do you need to be saved? Do you need God to do something? Because I got to tell you something, friends. God is doing something, and I am so incredibly excited to just see what God continues to do here at Friendship. As I've shared before, if you see the, some of the stuff in your bulletin, we've already had 10 baptisms this year. We have two more coming up in February. We have, I think, five or six already scheduled for Easter. I mean, we're only one month into the year, and we're looking at 18 baptisms, which is just huge. Isn't that what God does? Yeah, we don't have confetti cannons today, but we'll have them on Easter, right? You know, we're going to absolutely celebrate these things. And I just believe I am seeing people come to faith in friendship, at friendship, um, more than I ever have in the 15 years that I've pastored here. And that has really excited me, um, just watching what God is doing. And I am excited to see what he's going to continue to do. And I just believe that if you need healing, if you need a mountain moved, if you need that, God is going to do that in your life. Because you see, here at Friendship, we don't just come together just to have church, and people are not getting saved just because we have good music or good preaching or things like that. But no, we are here to follow Jesus together. You see, the first couple of Sundays this year, we kind of had a call to follow Jesus. We had you sign up on the wall out there. If you haven't signed our wall, I hope that you will today. Just grab a Sharpie off the chair and find a spot on on the paper, not on the paint, right? You know, and and sign your name that, yes, you want to follow Jesus. Because remember, friendship exists to bring people to Jesus Christ. That is why we are here. We are not here to build a bigger building. We are not here to make anything look big or look great. We are here to make Jesus look great and to bring people to know Jesus Christ and to develop them into fully mature, reproducing followers of Jesus Christ. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, I just want to tell you, this is what we're about. We are thrilled that you're here, but we make no apologies that what we want to do is we want to introduce you to Jesus, and we want to help you be a follower of Jesus. And so that's why this morning we are going to be looking at one of Jesus's longest and, and most known sermons where he explains to us how to follow him. You've already heard Malachi read the text, Matthew chapter 5. I hope that you have your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, please bring your Bibles. I was talking to Paula yesterday. We're going to do a Bible month at some point in the year because so many of you now just use your phones. And I I really want you to have a paper Bible. I want you to write in your paper Bible. I want you to circle that thing. I want you to like mark it up. So we're going to have a whole month. We're going to teach you how to use, we're going to call it back to the Bible or something. I don't know what we're going to call it. We always use the Bible. We're, We're such a digital society. And I just, I want to get us into our paper Bibles. Grab a Bible out of the chair in front of you. If you didn't want to, if you didn't bring one, if you have to use your phone, use your phone. I want you to see God's word so it sinks into you and really transforms you. Because today, Jesus is going to give us, I think, some of the most 
most basic and concrete examples of what it looks like to be a follower of him. Okay, what we're going to see this morning is that Jesus causes our righteousness, which really isn't our righteous actions, that's the righteous actions he gives us, but we're going to see that Jesus causes our righteous actions to draw others to him. The reason I believe that God is drawing other people to himself through friendship is because we are diligently trying to follow Jesus. And as we diligently follow Jesus, he brings other people to him. Let's, let's just look at the passage. Let's let Jesus' words speak for us this morning. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Look down at verse 14. You are the light of the world. I am so thankful that I popped into Pastor Steve's office this past week and asked him, I said, hey, if you were going to preach this passage, what would you pull out? And he said, well, I always pull out that you are the light, you are the salt. And I said, that's good. I'm going to steal that and I'll give you credit because I was going to preach, you need to be the salt, you need to be the light. But what does Jesus say? Does he say you need to be light and be salt or does he say you already are light and are salt? But you didn't know that, did you? Lick yourself. You're salty. Right? You, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is not something you need to become. This is something that you are. And notice what he says. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, my dad was a pastor, and he preached this passage, and he preached it before Google. I don't know how pastors did anything without the internet. And so it says that if it lost its saltiness, and my dad thought, I don't think salt can lose its saltiness. So he had to call the local university, got in touch with the chemistry department, and talked to one of the chemistry professors. And he said, hey, I'm a pastor of a church. I'm preaching this passage. And when Jesus says that the salt loses its saltiness, and my dad said, can salt lose its saltiness? And this chemistry professor, he says, no, it can't. Salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. Those of you chemists in here, you understand that. It will always be salt. Salt is salt. It cannot change. So it's like, okay, what in the world is Jesus talking about here? If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? In one sense, if you have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are salt, and you can't be anything but salt. You can't lose that witness and the power of the gospel. It shows the, the perpetuity of the gospel in your life. Do you know what I'm saying? When Jesus Christ saves you, once saved, always saved, you will always be salt. Now, you can become worthless salt, but you will always be salt. How do you become worthless salt? Salt works best when it's fine. That's why we put rice in the salt shaker, right? Because water makes salt clump up, doesn't it? Clumpy salt is worthless salt. But when salt is spread out fine, you can drop it on your food. It makes bland food taste good. Any of you put salt on all of your food? Any of you have high blood pressure, right? (laughs) You know? No, we we put salt on bland food. And I I just love how Jesus makes these uh, metaphors here. How many of us can find the gospel at times to unbelievers can be bland or may not appeal? But you know, when we recognize that we are salt and we live as salt, it makes the gospel palatable and palatable and draws people in. Not only that, but salt makes you thirsty. Thirsty for what? For water. Who's the living water? Oh, you, Rick, you knew that. You saw that coming, didn't you? See? I, sorry, I got to pick on Rick. Rick is newer to the faith, and he's coming along, and he used to be here, and he said, you know, I'm just totally lost through the whole sermon. And as soon as I said water, I saw his eyes light, and I thought, Rick knows, and that's what we do here. Sorry, just, that's what we do here. We bring people to Jesus, and they begin to see it, and, they, and you got it. And if you were just lost, you're going to know, and we're going to use this illustration in a couple of weeks, and a couple of months, and you're going to know because that's what happens here at Friendship, okay? People come, and they know Jesus. Not only does salt, salt preserves dead things, right? Dead meat, you rub it full of salt. We live in a dead world. We are here to preserve the world. There's actually indications in the ancient Near East that salt was a fertilizer. Now, again, too much salt in the soil will kill the plants, but an appropriate amount of salt can preserve the plants. When we are salt and when we are spread out the way Jesus intended us to be, we salt the earth and we accomplish great things because, you see, salt and light always affect their environment, okay? Salt and light, it stresses an outward focus because it is always changing. Salt changes meat. Salt changes food. Salt changes ice. It melts the ice. Some of the people that you're trying to reach have like these cold hearts, but the salt gently sprinkled 
will slowly melt the ice and soften the heart so that the gospel of Jesus can go in. Not only are we the salt of the earth, but notice verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus calls us the light of the world. Now, back in my days when I had more energy, I probably would have blacked out all the windows in this room and made the room pitch black at this point. That was also before we had live stream and needed lights and all that kind of stuff, right? But you know what's fascinating is when you have light, this single candle, you all have been in dark rooms. If it was pitch black in here and I lit this one candle, we would all be able to see. Not well, but we would be able to see because light illumines the darkness. And light illumines every bit of darkness it's in. In fact, the only way to eliminate this light, notice what he says, is people don't put a lamp under a basket. I can cover the light, but all I'm doing right now is blocking the light from you. It's lit behind my hands, right? It's fully lit there. I can block the light, but I cannot stop the light from penetrating all of the darkness that it's around. We are light and we are designed to penetrate the darkness and to illumine the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the ways that we do it wrong is we begin to team up. When you go eat your steak, take the cap off the salt shaker and just dump it on the steak. Some of you do that, most of you don't. You'll throw up. That much salt will kill you. What does a thousand candles together look like? Isn't this warming? Doesn't a candle, a flame, it, just, it draws you in, doesn't it? What is a thousand candles all together? The church, you bring some of your unsafe friends here, right? And we hit them with a thousand candle watt. Oh, oh, don't you love me? Don't you love it? Isn't this great? Don't you see the light? Don't you see the light? It's horrible, isn't it? I did it first service and a guy got up and ran out and I hope I didn't like give him a seizure or something, you know? But I think too often we forget as Christians, we want Christian power. And we begin to get together and we begin to shine our light brighter and brighter. Was there anything attractive about this light? No. It repelled you. Like you guys were like visibly wincing. Is there anything attractive about this light? Guys, it is our individual light in the darkness that draws people to Jesus Christ. People are stumbling around in the dark. Last night, we had like 30 minutes before bed. I didn't want to watch a movie, so what I do when I want to kill 30 minutes and I still want to be a cool dad is we do YouTube with dad. And so we go downstairs and we watch random YouTube videos. And so we were going downstairs and I like to watch TV in the dark and the room was dark and I knew where the couch was. And so I'm walking around to the couch and I did not know that there was a coffee table in the middle of the room until my shin found the coffee table. And I started yelling and screaming like, who left the coffee table? I mean, the coffee table. I should have known it was there. I, I, I don't know what I thought. And, and man, and so Eden comes in and she turns on the lights. She's like, dad, what's wrong? I'm like, turn off the lights. I don't need the lights. But you know, as soon as the lights came on, I was like, there's a coffee table in the middle of the room. How many of our friends, though, are walking around in darkness, banging their shins? They meet you for a drink and all they can complain about is how bad their shins hurt and how messed up their life is. Our responsibility is not to blind them, but to provide just enough light to bring them to Jesus Christ, to draw them in and to introduce them to the gospel. Notice you don't hide the light. You don't put it under a bushel. No, you put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see what? What is our light? They may see your, what's the next two words? Good works. Our light is our good works. When people see our good works, they should talk about how awesome we are and say that we are such wonderful people. Do you see that there at the end of verse 16? What does it say? When they see your good works, they will... Yeah, this is the part where we all look down and we all say it out loud. It's a teaching technique. If you say it, you will learn it, right? They see your good works and what? Good. We have like 17 different versions, but all the gist of it is they will praise God. They will give glory to your heavenly father. When people see our light, it should draw them to see Jesus. One of the things that was always hard for me 
is some of our kids have 504s and IEPs, and some of those kids were adopted. And so we would go into these meetings, and we'd kind of walk through, through these things. And Paula and I always just wanted to bless the teachers, because we'd heard that, like, there's parents that go in, and they're angry and about their rights, and my 504 is not being followed, and, you know, you guys have to do this, and you have to do this, and have to do that. So we would always, like, bring Starbucks, and we'd bring chocolate, and we'd just tell the teachers how grateful we were for everything that they were doing, because we just wanted to make a really good impression. And we would say, hey, but what they would always do is they would turn it back on us and say, oh, these kids are so wonderful. They're so well, lucky to have you as parents. And like, I got so frustrated then because it's like, it's not about me. I'm trying to bless you because I want you to see Jesus. Now, I understand these are probably non believers, and they don't like, they're not going to be like, oh, thank you for the chocolate. I see Jesus in you. That, that's a weird thing to say. But like, the whole goal was not to be like, aren't we great people? The whole goal was to say, we want to love on you as teachers and administrative staff so that you might see our God. We don't adopt or do these things because we think we're great. We do this because this is what God does in our lives. God is the one who does this. We always want our good works to point back to Him. As our light shines, as the salt shines, it's to draw people to God. You see, and so that's, that's really, I got ahead of myself, but that's this next point. Our salt and light should point others to God, not to us. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Now, when Jesus is preaching here, the people are listening to him and they're starting to scratch their heads because Jesus is not teaching like a typical rabbi. He's not teaching like a typical teacher of the law. Because the typical teacher of the law, typical to many of you, how many of you were raised in certain uh, churches where every week that you went, the preacher told you all the bad things you were doing? You're not good enough for God if you don't come forward and you don't pray and you don't do this and you don't do this. You're going to burn in hell. Like, and some of you, like, you're like, preach it, brother. That's what we need more around here. Some of you, my dad included, he was raised in that kind of church and he lived his entire life, even to his deathbed. I think he always lo- wondered if God really loved him. Because every single church service was, you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to. Yes, it, it's a, you can guilt motivate people to do about anything you want. But that's not how Jesus operates. And people were used to coming in and being taught, well, now the law says this, but, and then they would add a whole bunch of junk onto the law. Well, Jesus wasn't doing that right now. Jesus is actually teaching something totally differently. And so people are going to begin to ask Jesus, like, so so do you not, you know, the Old Testament says a bunch of do this and don't do this. And you're just coming in and talking about being salt and being light. And so Jesus says this. He says, listen, don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Verse 17. He says, that's not what I came. I am not here to get rid of the law. No, no, no. On the contrary, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay. He says, I have come to fulfill them. I have come to show you the entire point of the law and the prophets. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now he's talking about the law and the prophets. He's not just talking about the 10 commandments. He's actually talking about the entire Old Testament. Everything that was taught in the Old Testament, and Jesus says, I want you to understand this. Until heaven and earth pass, not one little mark from the Hebrew script will disappear until all is accomplished. Now, most of us don't speak Hebrew. Most of us don't read Hebrew, so that doesn't make sense. But we do read English. So let's let's do a little English exercise here, okay? I have taken three English letters. They make the word eat. You will notice that they are made with nine brush strokes. Any kindergarten teachers in here, you do the line down. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine strokes of the pen make this word. What would happen if we left off a stroke of the pen? This happens real easy in life, doesn't it? You see that? You can take away one stroke and you can turn eat to fat. That happens for a lot of us. We add one stroke with a fork. What's the point here? You can remove and you point here. You can remove and you can by simply changing one stroke of one letter. And Jesus says, God's law is so perfect that I'm telling you not even one stroke will disappear until all is fulfilled. By the way, just to give you a little confidence in your Bible, you understand the English Bible, the reason when I had you guys all read it, you were all over the place. It's a translation from Hebrew and Greek, and so each translation is going to be a little bit different. But the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The oldest copy of the, of, of the book of Isaiah that we had was from around 1000 AD. So we're in 2023 now. 
1,000 AD, Jesus is at zero, right? So we had a copy that was about 1,000 years old. You can go see a, a book of Isaiah. I forget where it is, but it's in Hebrew, and it's about 1,000 years old. Well, Isaiah was written like 700 years before Jesus. Well, what happened? How many changes were made and all that passed down from 700 years before Jesus to 1,000 years after Jesus to our copy of Isaiah? Do you see what I'm talking about? There's a 1,700-year gap. Well, you would assume that people are sloppy, they copied, they made mistakes, and so our version of Isaiah is probably not what Isaiah wrote. Well, then a shepherd boy was throwing some rocks up in a cave. He heard it hit some clay and heard it break. He went up there, he found what was called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everybody's at least heard of that, right? There is a scroll of Isaiah. It's called 1Q Isaiah A. It is a complete copy of Isaiah from 100 years before Jesus. So we are 100 years before Jesus to zero, and then we add 1,000 years after that. There's 1,100 years between this copy of Isaiah and our copy of Isaiah. Are you with me? It'd be easier to see on a screen. I'm just walking you through it. How much change do you think happened between this copy of Isaiah and the Dead Sea Scrolls and our copy of Isaiah? Virtually none. They're like 99.97% in agreement. And they were all hand copied for 1,100 years. The scribes that copied, they actually knew the middle letters of each book and the middle letters of such. And when you got to letter number 7,362, if it wasn't a race or if it wasn't a, a maim or a lamech or whatever that letter was, you threw the whole thing away and started over. You didn't just mark out. That's why this copy that we have from a thousand years ago and so on. Guys, you can trust your Bible. I'm taking a little rabbit trail here. I want you to know you can trust your Bible. And Jesus himself said, you can trust your Bible because as I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. Now, a lot of people think that by fulfilling it, he means now it no longer applies. Well, that would be the same thing as abolishing it, okay? When he says, I didn't come to abolish it, the law is a revelation of God's character. Does God change? No. So does God's law change? No. With the same God that said, do not murder, does he now approve of murder? No, he has never approved of murder because God created humans in his image and he always reflects that character that he values human life. So if Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, what are we supposed to do? Well, notice what he says. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. If you begin to say, well, don't worry about the, the law. It doesn't really apply. It doesn't really matter. He says, if that's what you teach, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you do them and you teach them, you will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Guys, it's a serious thing to follow Jesus. And we have been called to follow Jesus and we have been called to do everything that he has called us to do. And notice what he says and he raises the bar in the next verse. For I tell you, verse 20, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never even enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, you got to understand, I'm not here to, to undo the law. I am here to let you know that the law is so much higher that your righteousness has to exceed what the scribes and Pharisees do. Now, the scribes and Pharisees, they were right people. And they followed the law to a T. In fact, if you walked in here this morning and he, they saw you, you know, giving your, chi your child giving you five bucks and they said, wait, your child gave you five bucks. And you're like, yeah, I know my kid wanted to go at Starbucks. And so I paid for it on the app and they were giving me five bucks. I don't know that you can get anything for five bucks at Starbucks. It's more like seven fifty. But anyway, for sake of illustration, five dollars. And then the Pharisee would say, so, so how much was the actual drink? And you say, well, it was four seventy five. They gave me five. He rounded it off. Oh, so you made twenty five cents on the deal. So you will be tithing 2.5 cents this morning because you made a quarter, right? Or else the wrath of God will be upon you because you have failed to tithe the 25 cents that you made off your child. You're like, no, no, the gas that I've spent and the hundreds of thousands I've spent on my kid, I don't think I'm making any money on my kid for $5 for a Starbucks drink. No, it doesn't matter. You made a quarter. You owe us 2.5 cents. Like, that's how the Pharisees were. They were so incredibly righteous. And Jesus says, your righteousness has to be better than that. You have to be that much more, which is, that's ridiculous. But here's what I want you to understand. The righteousness of the Pharisees was an external righteousness, and he is calling us to an internal heart righteousness. Something that really breaks my heart. I got caught up in a Pharisaical cult when I was in my teenage years. First couple years of college that I went to, I remember hearing people preach there was one pastor that preached, and this is what Pharisees do. You have to have your own pet doctrine. 
You have to have something. I know one pastor that believed Jesus died on Wednesday. Most people believe Jesus died on Friday. Some people think he died on Thursday. This pastor believed he had, Jesus had to die on Wednesday because he had to be dead for three full days and full nights. And the only way to get a full 72 hours by Sunday morning is to have Jesus die on Wednesday. And so he would make, you know, Good Friday on Wednesday. It's, it's crazy. I heard a preacher one time preach, you know, because women should dress modestly. That's in the Bible. That's the law. Women should dress modestly. And he explained that that meant that women should never wear flip-flops. Because, women, did you know that when you wear flip-flops, in order to keep them on your foot, you have to scrunch your toes to kind of hold the, the front, whatever you call that thing that goes down between your toes, and that makes your calf muscle tighten. And a guy walking behind you, seeing your calf muscle tighten, will start to lust, and there will soon be adultery in babies because those things happen. And so this pastor said that any woman wearing flip-flops was absolutely sinning and completely immodest. For those of you that are thinking this is real, please, I mean, it, it actually happened, but please understand that's nowhere in the Bible, okay? That is like adding to, that is such an external righteousness that I don't wear flip-flops, I'm modest and conceited and proud and arrogant. The Pharisees, they used to go around and every time they memorized a Bible verse, they would put it in a little box. Any of you seen those like little daily bread boxes that have Bible verses in them? Well, because the Bible says the word should be on your mind, right? They would strap the box to their forehead, Okay, they would walk around with boxes on their forehead with little Bible verses in them. And of course, the more verses you memorized, the bigger your box. That's actually where the ball cap came from, is some of them actually had a box that stuck out to here. And, you know, and so they would begin to walk around, and they you know, had this big old duckbill thing sticking out because they were super righteous. You could tell how many Bible verses they had memorized. And Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Like, that's so external. What he's calling us to, the light and the salt, is an internal righteousness. It's a righteousness that only comes by being transformed through the gospel. It's a righteousness that brings people in. And again, let me give you an illustration. The Bible teaches that homosexuality is a sin. Okay? Because I am very strongly straight and because I don't understand homosexuality, because it's actually repulsive to me, it's very easy for me to talk about the evils of homosexuality. It's very easy for me to say that you shouldn't be gay and that that's a sin and blah, 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 to act gay and to act on those impulses is a sin and it's easy to preach on that. And that's right and that's biblical. But what the law actually says is that we are to behave in a sexually moral way. What the law actually says is that all sex outside of a covenant marriage between a man and a woman is adultery and sin. That means the teenagers that are having sex is sin. That means the seniors that are having sex is a sin. That means lust, Jesus is going to get to, Pastor C is going to preach next week, that is a sin. All sexual immorality is sin. It's not just those who struggle with homosexuality. And when I begin to look into God's perfect law, I begin to realize that I'm not much better than my gay friends. And I begin to realize that we're all in trouble. Because the light of the gospel begins to shine into my heart as much as theirs. And I begin to realize that there is none righteous before God. And Jesus begins to explore this and explain this to us in ways so that if we're really going to be salt and light, we're not going to be beaming a, a spotlight on all the gays. We're on a gay hunt. Let's find them, you know, and root them out. We're going to look into the mirror of God's word and say, you know what? Let's start with me. Am I living sexually pure? Am I living the way God would have me? Do I need to confess my own sinfulness? Do I need to find forgiveness at the foot of the cross? Because I'll tell you this, if my gay brother needs to do the same thing, which I believe that they do, how in the world can I lead them if I haven't humbled my own self and acknowledged my own shortcomings? By the way, what do you think is salt and warm light short of sitting down with a friend and saying, before I talk about any problems you may have, let me explain the own sexual immorality that I've had to confess. Let me explain how God's word has convicted me because I'm not the person I used to be. And I just want you to know that. Is that not more winsome? Is that not more palatable? Does that not maybe make Jesus look better? Does that not maybe glorify God by acknowledging our own brokenness? My friends, if we're going to be salt and light, we have to engage the culture. We have to understand how to apply God's law to the culture. And the teacher in me wants to kind of walk you through this and explain this a little bit to you because there's kind of four different ways, five different ways, depends on who you look at it. There's a bunch of different ways, but I'm going to put it in a table for you just to try to make it easier to understand. These are the ways that we kind of interact with the culture, okay? How are we salt and light in the world? Let's start over here with fortify and retreat, okay? This is Jesus against culture. 
This is, the Amish is probably the best example. Uh, sometimes it's homeschoolers do it this way. So, certain churches, Baptist churches are known for doing this. This is the don't dance, don't play with cards. Ha- women have to wear skirts. Anybody raised in those churches? This is the pull out of the world. The world is bad. Leave the world. Let the world go to hell in a handbasket because we're pulling back and we are the godlies. We are the, we are the protected ones. We are the ones doing this. The world is bad. Protect, protect, fortify, put up walls. Don't let the movies into your home. You know, there was a, <laughs> I heard of a TV preacher once that a lady wrote in, old lady, and she said, you know, you once said that the other end of cable television went straight into the pits of hell, and now you're on cable television. What does that say? You know? (laughs) But you know, a lot of, and you guys have heard that kind of preaching, like, get out of the world, pull out of the world, pull out of the world, okay? That's not being salt and light. That's just pulling all of our salt into a salt clump, and that's putting all of our candles in this building, which is kind of under a bushel, and it's not making an impact in the world. If we were to go to the other end of the extreme, it's called dominate. Now, this is actually fascinating. It's not really a line. It's more of a horseshoe because, believe it or not, the fortify and the dominate are actually pretty close together. They're just both completely off the point. This is where Jesus forces the culture. This is where we try to make the entire world Christian, and we believe that our calling is to Christianize the world. This is a lot of like um, God and country kind of a thing where the two are really wed hand in hand, and you got to be really careful with that because that's exactly opposite of how everybody in the New Testament operated. Now, again, are there times that we, we retreat? Absolutely. There's maybe a chance, but most likely I can't see any need for a Christian to go to a strip club, okay? That's an area we should probably retreat from, okay? Now, maybe you're a woman and God has called you to reach the women in that industry, and maybe you're able to go and and have relationships there. I don't know. I would assume they serve food. I would assume, you know, you could get a Coke there, uh, but there's a lot of other places to buy a Coke. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I just don't see any reason for us to do that. There we need to retreat. Over here, we we, we pass laws. You know, we can outlaw uh, strip clubs. We can do such things. I'm all for legislating that as much as we can. I am grateful that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. I think that is wonderful. But I don't believe that our entire goal is to force the culture through the legal system to change. There was a movement several years ago to get all the Christians to move to South Carolina. Did any of you read about that? Somebody was trying, because I guess South Carolina has a strong Christian population. And the idea was if all the Christians in the United States would move to South Carolina... In essence, we could retreat, form a Christian state, elect only Christian governors, only Christian legislators, enact only Christian laws. It would be this Mecca, and then we would slowly dominate, and we would push forward into, South Car- or into North Carolina and into Georgia and slowly retake the world for Jesus. Oh! No, bad idea. Okay, Jesus doesn't force culture. This, these middle three is assimilate. Here we retreat, here we dominate, here we assimilate, but even here we have some problems, and I think this is where most of us fall This is separate, Jesus apart from culture. And a lot of you live with this. I almost called it bifurcate. That's a big word. Um, I think there was another word I was trying to think of that I can't think of at the moment that was even more confusing, but it's more accurate. I think a lot of our Catholic friends do this, and I think a lot of us do this. This is where on Sunday, we love Jesus. We are in church. We dress pretty. We say good things. We pray. We raise our hands. We sing songs. And we, we mean it. I don't think any of you are faking it this morning. I think you are here because you genuinely love Jesus. And that is, if I were to ask you, you know, are you just being a fake this morning? You'd say, no, I'm, I'm here. I love Jesus. I'm singing the songs. I'm listening to the sermon. I'm nodding my head. I agree. You're going to go home and you're going to watch football. And, you know, let's say the Pro Bowl, nobody cares about that. Next Sunday, you know, quarterback's going to throw, it's going to get intercepted. You're going to drop the F-bomb. You're going to speak, you're going to start uh, uh, gossiping about somebody. You're going to go to work and you're just going to goof off online and, and play Rum Royale all day or something or update your Facebook page and, and so on and so forth. And if I were to ask you, is that how a Christian should live? It never even crossed your mind. Some of you have not even cracked a Bible since last Sunday. I'm not saying that you're a bad person. I'm just saying you have separated your Christian life from the rest of your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? You lived your entire life this week. You ate your food. You went to work. You spent your money. You watched your movie. You watched TikTok. You hung out with your friends. I don't, I'm not saying that you were a bad person. I'm not saying you did bad things. I'm just saying Jesus didn't cross your mind and the idea to be salt and light was nowhere there. But now you're here and you're salt, you're light. Preach it. I got it. Do you see what I'm talking about? How you've separated the two? You can't do that. Followers of Jesus bring the two together. Some of you are like me. You're the exact opposite. Have you seen the t-shirt? Hold on a minute while I overthink this. You went to Marshall's yesterday. You saw a cool shirt. You thought, I need the shirt. I'm going to buy the shirt. And then you thought, 
Maybe I don't. Maybe I'm coveting the shirt. Maybe I shouldn't covet the shirt. And then you thought, but have I tithed? Am I spending money that really should be going to God? You know, I probably could sponsor a compassion child in the amount of money that I'm going to spend on this shirt. But I really do like the shirt, and it's kind of cute. Wait, I wonder if this shirt was made in a sweatshop. If I buy this shirt, I'm actually employing sweat. I'm probably employing kids. And that, that's not a Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus wouldn't buy this shirt. Boy, I need a shirt. I don't have that shirt, and that shirt kind of matches. And then you just end up... Sp- any of you do that? Am I the only one that can like way overthink things and spin myself into, okay, this is why we have this thing called the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit says buy the shirt, buy the shirt. Sorry, you're always going to think it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, sometimes the Holy Spirit will say don't buy the shirt, right? And then you have to put the shirt back on the rack and you have to leave it and let the Holy Spirit guide you because you can't get confused where everything about Jesus is this, you know, if I go to Starbucks, but Starbucks totally supports the gay agenda, does that mean every latte I buy is blah, blah, blah? Like you can totally drive yourself insane. Live by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is where there's that sweet spot in the middle that sometimes will call us to retreat. Sometimes will call us to push forward and, and legislate some morality. Will tell us to separate sometimes and other times cause us to wrestle. Maybe there are sweatshops. Maybe we do need to think where our money's going. Maybe we do need to ask if we really need that shirt. But for the most part, we simply live lives under the lordship of Jesus. And we let our lives be light and salt, salt sprinkled around, light dispelling the darkness. Maybe buying the shirt, I'm able to smile at the cashier and say, hey, how's your day going? I'm not expecting them to come to faith right at that moment, but I am expecting to maybe open up a door and just show love and show compassion and be salt and be light that Jesus has called me to be. You see, our goal is to fulfill the law and the prophets. We have to embrace the permanency of the Bible. The Old Testament didn't just stop being when Jesus came. It always revealed God's character. But we have to go and teach God's commands. But we teach God's commands not as an external righteousness, not as in you better measure up to our holy huddle. But no, we embrace a righteousness that comes from Jesus. God's commands show us how much we need Jesus. And we can only live right lives before God through the power of Jesus in our lives. So you see, I ask you this question this morning. What changes are you affecting in those around you? I really, I, if you think of nothing else this morning, How did you affect change this past week? As a student, at your work, with your grandchildren, with the server at the restaurant, how did you affect change? Did people hear your bitterness? Did they hear your gossip? Did they hear your foul language? Did they notice that you were cheap? Did they notice that you were ungracious? Or did they see the love of God in you? Did they hear positive and encouraging words come out of your mouth, whether that was to your children, to your students, to your employees, to your supervisors, to your clients, to your customers, to your grandchildren, to your nieces, your nephews, to your pet, to your dog? Like when you're playing at the dog park, what do people hear coming out of your mouth? What do people see in the way that you live your life? Do you exhibit the lifestyle of one who is so in love with the world and all of the you know, Lululemon clothes and your brand new Starbucks thing, getting out of your brand new car and your perfect little everything all together because you have it all together? Or did they see someone that genuinely loves the people around them? Not that any of those things are wrong. But are you engaging in love? Are you engaging in pointing people? Did people experience salt and light in your life? Because you are salt and you are light. And if some of you are light and you're hiding yourself because you don't want people to know that you're a Christian, now please understand, when you go to into a meeting tomorrow, and somebody gives a proposal, and they lay it out, and they turn to you, and they say, hey, what's your thought? And you say, I think my thought is you're all going to hell, and this meeting means nothing, and you all need to embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's truth. That's a 10,000-watt spotlight, people, okay? <laughs> In YouTube with Dad last night, we were looking at silly test question answers, and there was an algebra problem, and somebody, a little kid, or the student had written, Jesus is the answer <laughs> to everything. And the teacher wrote, Jesus is the answer to a lot, but not to this math problem, you know? (laughs) When you're in that meeting and they give that proposal and you're supposed to give a feedback to it or whatever, giving the best feedback, giving gracious feedback, giving honest feedback, you know, serving it, that will be light, that will be salt. Are you being, you are salt, you are light, are you doing it in an effective way? Are you doing and teaching God's righteousness? And are you reflecting a love of self or a love of God and others? 
y'all are going to hell. That's why I go to church. If you went to my church, you'd be saved. You're not as good as me. True salt, true light. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. True salt, true light is embracing sinners. True salt, true light is looking at a coworker who's having a bad day. And of course, when your coworker has a bad day, you have a bad day because they're not doing their job, which means you now have to do your job and their job. Salt and light says, let me take you to lunch. I'm going to buy. Something's bothering you. I want to listen. And it means you actually spend the whole lunch listening, not talking. Obviously, he's having issues with his girlfriend. Obviously, it's because they're living in sin. Obviously, it's because he's spending all the money on lottery tickets. Like, you know the problem. Listen. Shut up. Listen. Let them speak. And then pray the whole time, God, can I sprinkle a little salt? Not rub salt in the wound, that hurts. Sprinkle the salt, shine the light, introduce them to Jesus Christ. That's how we follow Jesus together. Lord God, my prayer this morning is that we would be a community of people that continue to follow Jesus Christ. And I pray that we wouldn't separate that, Lord. I know probably 90%, 98% of people in this room right now are absolutely, let's do it, let's do it. But God, a lot of us won't even crack our Bibles till next Sunday. A lot of us won't even think about you till next Sunday. But my prayer is that that would change. My prayer is that your Holy Spirit would bring your thought to mind throughout this week. And we would say, I am, I'm salt. I'm light. I'm going to smile at that customer. I'm going to pray with this person. I'm just going to pray internally because that person doesn't want me to pray out loud. I'm going to just step up and do this extra thing. I'm going to do, Lord, whatever it is the Holy Spirit puts on us. May we be people that are led by the Spirit. And may we minister in the Spirit so that lives are changed and that people glorify you and not us. And that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end the way we always end. I'm going to invite the praise team to come, but more importantly, I'm going to invite the men to come serve the Lord's Supper. Trying to be salt, trying to be light is quite overwhelming. But being reminded that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Being reminded that he said, if I leave, I'll send my Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth. Being reminded that the Holy Spirit lives in you. I love it. He gave us something to eat. This cracker is going to go and become in you and actually molecularly infuse every one of the cells in your body. Isn't that awesome? Well, you didn't think through the science, any, probably science nutritionist people in here. That's what's going to happen with this little cracker. That's what's going to happen with this juice. It is going to go into our body and infuse every cell of our body. Do you understand that's what the Holy Spirit does for you? This is a picture of the work of Jesus in you. And the only way that you will be salt and light this week is through the power of Jesus in you, which is why I invite you to come to this table. Understand it's just a cracker and it's just juice, but at the same time, Jesus said it is his body and it is his blood. Jesus gave thanks. And Lord Jesus, I want to give thanks to you for this wafer, for this juice that reminds us that it is you and us, the hope of glory. It is not up to us. Would you use this in a powerful way? My friends, you don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be a Baptist. But you do have to be a follower of Jesus. If you plan to just separate your Christianity and live your life the way you plan next week, I'm not saying it's going to be bad. And then you're going to come back in next week. This is not a way to clean up your life. A lot of people think, I went forward, I took Lord's Supper, now I'm good for a whole other week. That's not how it works. You take Lord's Supper to remind you to be empowered through the Holy Spirit this week to be salt and light so that you can come back next week and be encouraged yet again. Are you going to mess up? Absolutely. Are you going to forget to read your Bible one day? Absolutely. Are you going to let a bad word go out of your mouth? Are you going to gossip about somebody? Probably so. But by God's grace, it'll happen less each week as we grow in our salt and light. Would you stand together? Let's sing. Once everyone has been served, we will partake together. As always, the prepackaged are here in the middle. This is your time. You can come as you're ready.
it is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stand. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is to spare. To this I hold. My friends, we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Every time I preach, I can look out the back window and there's cars going up and down Route 2. I'm sure some of them are going to church, but I suspect the vast majority are living today with no knowledge of Jesus Christ. And my friends, we're getting ready to leave this place to be salt, to be light in the darkness, and to invite them not to come to church, but to come to know Jesus Christ. Because you see, he said this blood is the new covenant in his blood. And that if he began this work in us, that he would be faithful to come back and get us. But in the meantime, he gives us the option, gives us the opportunity to bring people to him. So let's do that, my friends, in remembrance of him until he comes. Oh, Lord Jesus, may you come soon. Amen. Let's sing that last verse together. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not
respond to the awesome gospel of Jesus. Good morning, church. Leslie Wilson, I'll give you a few uh, announcements before we leave. We have a, a few things coming up. First, if you are a part of the Peru mission trip or you're interested in being a part of the trip, there is a meeting next Sunday after this service. So please be sure to attend that if you're going. Second, Operation Christmas Child has a box in the office where we're collecting t-shirts, old t-shirts or new t-shirts, and we're going to be using those t-shirts to make rope in the boxes that we send. So please bring in your t-shirts and deposit them in the office. Then on February 15th, which is a Wednesday, it's the day after a Valentine's Day, we're having an intergenerational dinner where the youth would like to love on the seniors. So if you are a senior and you would like to attend, that's going to be February 15th from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. And more information will be coming soon about that dinner. And then finally, this one's very important. We're going to be having a celebration dinner for everyone. And I've just been told by Fred that we're already half booked. So there are only 150 seats for this dinner. And it's going to be uh, catered by Skipper's Pier. So if you're interested in attending that, that's going to be on the 26th of February from 5 to 7 p.m. That's a Sunday evening. So make sure that if you are interested in attending, that you sign up in the lobby after service because seats are going fast. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Robert. Guys, the problem is we've run out of space in here. <laughs> Last year we had round tables and we did a dinner and we couldn't seat anymore. So this time we're doing heavy hors d'oeuvres, but we're still trying to create little pods we need a bigger building, which is awesome, because we're full. This is only one service. The first service was nearly full this morning as well. So that's why we're capping it at 150. Um, we got to pray. We got to celebrate what God has done and look forward to what he's going to do in the future. I do want to say for those of you who are seniors, I hope that you will come out on Wednesday night, the 15th. The youth group would love to connect with you, love on you. They're not just going to serve you dinner. We're going to put three seniors and three teens at each table so you guys get to know each other, because part of passing the baton and coming together is that if you say, I don't know if I'm a senior or not, here's the deal. Can you drive? Because I want the ones that can't drive to be there, and you can come. I don't care if you're 45. I don't care if you have kids in the youth group and you just want to be around your kids doing cool things. If you will drive a senior, because if you are a senior that says, Robert, that's after dark, I don't drive, I am going to send, not a teenager, don't worry, I will send a 45-year-old to pick you up because we really want you here. If we need to have the golf cart out, we will do that because we want to be together. Does that make sense? So if you're willing to drive, email the church office and say, hey, I may not be a senior, but I would love to bring a senior. And everybody else say, we want everybody to come because we want to connect you guys together and then on the 22nd absolutely celebrate as you leave you got to check out the awesome welcome booth that chris wilson built it is gorgeous and not only is it beautiful but that is where you get your answer to all things friendship we struggle to communicate here and fred is always going to be at that booth between and after services you can ask any question if anything that was presented today if you're a first-time guest if you need a bible if you want to sign up for peru any of that you can always go to the welcome center there will always be somebody there shouldn't say always. The theory is that there will always be somebody there. Fred gets pulled in a lot of different directions, but we're staffing that up so that you can always get any questions for everything here. Does that make sense? I want to dismiss you with some scripture, and it's going to say this. Momentarily, when we find it. May the Lord guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. May you be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Did you know that scripture? It's from Isaiah 58, 11. May you go in God's grace and peace.